Um, the role of the nervous system is that it controls the functions. It helps to control the functions of the human body. It's able to analyze incoming stimuli and it integrates internal and external responses. So our- Chanel's trying to get in, I'm sorry. It's okay, thank you. Um, the nervous system is made up of the central nervous system, um, the CNS, so that's the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is um, the peripheral nervous system is composed of various sensor receptors that help bring that information into the central nervous system, and then those motor nerves that carry the information away from the CNS to facilitate a response to stimuli. The autonomic nervous system uses components of the CNS and the PNS um, to regulate autonomic or unconscious responses to stimuli. Ms. Davis, can you change the slides, please? I'm sorry. Yes. You must say, see Amy, um, a oh race boy. Every time I think I have my life together. Well, you know, is it, why did you do it? Did you hold up something that said change the slide? Yes. <laughs> you did? I didn't see it, but that's so funny because Dr. Ertwine, when we um, like have meetings and stuff, she made this cup that says you're on mute. <laughs> so that when people start talking and they're on mute, they know. Maybe, you, maybe she should make you a, a mug, Amy, and you can just hold it up that says change the slide. Oh, every time I think I have my life together. Okay. So what is the function of the nervous system, of the cells that make up the nervous system? Um, the structural unit of our nervous system in the nerve cell is, we call it the nerve cell, or it can also be called a neuron. Um, there's billions of nerve cells that make up the nervous system and they're all organized in a certain way that it allows movement. Um, it allows the realization of various sensations and it provides response to internal stimuli, external stimuli. It helps stimulate learning, our thinking and our emotions. So this is just a picture of the neuron. Um, each neuron is made up of a cell body or you can also call it a soma, um, which contains the nucleus, the cytoplasm, um, various different granules, and there's other particles in there. They have short branch-like projections that cover most of the surface. They're known as dendrites. And these structures um, provide an increased surface area for those neurons to travel, and they bring information into the neuron from other surrounding neurons. So this stuff should all kind of be like a um, review from anatomy and physiology. So all like all other cell membranes, the nerve membranes also have various channels or pores that control the movement of different substances in and out of a cell. Um, some of these channels allow the movement of sodium, potassium, and calcium. When the cells are at rest, their membranes are, per, are impermeable to sodium. However, the membranes are still permeable to those potassium ions. Neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters stimulate postsynaptic cells by either inhibiting them or exciting them. Um, the reaction that occurs when a neurotransmitter stimulates a receptor site is going to depend on the specific neurotransmitter that it releases and what site, what receptor site it's going to activate. Um, acetylcholine communicates between nerves and muscles, and this is found in many of our pathways in the brain. Then you have nor norepinephrine and epinephrine. These are catecholamines. They are gonna be released by nerves in the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. And they are classified as hormones when they are released from cells in the um, adrenal medulla. They occur in high levels in particular areas of the brain, such as the limbic system. 
And then dopamine, which is found in very high concentrations in certain areas of the brain, is involved in coordination of our impulses and our responses in, our both, in both motor and intellectual responses. Then we have our GABA, which is found in the brain. It's going to inhibit nerve activity. It's important because it's, um, it works to prevent overexcitability or stimulation, such as in um, when we're having a seizure. And then we have serotonin, which is also found in the limbic system. It's important in arousal and sleep, as well as preventing depression and, mot and promoting motivation. So this is just an anatomy of the brain. Um, this is in your book if you guys want to take a look at it. So anxiolytic and hypnotic agents. So, oops. All right, so anxiolytics, they are drugs that we use to depress the central nervous system. It prevents or reduces the signs and symptoms of anxiety. Um, we have sedatives, which are drugs that depress, that depress the CNS. These can produce a loss of awareness. They can also provide a sense of calmness for the patient, and it can make um, patients unaware of the environment. And we have hypnotics, which are drugs that are also used to depress the CNS and they cause sleep. We have minor tranquilizers, which are drugs that produce a state of tranquil tranquility in anxious patients. Um, some of the medicines that you will see um, used, some commonly used medications are um, Ambien, Buspirone, Lunesta, um, some antihistamines like promethazine, Benadryl. Um, these are some of the medicines that you will see. Um, older patients are more susceptible to the adverse effects of these drugs um, because they have more, have more on, um, anticipated CNS effects. Um, they're going to be subjected to um, increased uh, um, sedation. Um, they could be more dizzy than just a regular adult would because they're older. Um, they have a tendency to have hallucinations more than um, the younger class of adults. Um, the thing that you really want to be aware of is that if you have a patient who is taking Ambien, you want to make sure that if they stop taking it or they, decept, they decide that they don't need it anymore, that you need to withdraw gradually. You don't just want to stop this medication. So if you're prescribed, if you're get, educating a patient about it who's going to be discharged from the hospital, you want to make sure you tell them. Please make sure if for some reason you decide you're not going to take this medicine anymore that you call your doctor first because you have to be, um, you have to step down from the medicine gradually. Um, you also want to monitor their renal and their hepatic function um, because people that, um, adults that have issues with renal clearance and metabolism might not be able to um, take this medication as long as some other people would. So, when would we give, so psychological states affected by these drugs. So there's anxiety. So anxiety is described as a feeling of tension. Um, some patients might say they feel nervous, they feel apprehensive, um, or they just are scared, they are fearful. Um, it usually involves unpleasant reactions to a stimulus, whether it's an actual or an unknown. So sometimes patients can also, can tell you right away what they're afraid of, what they feel anxious about. Sometimes they don't know what it is and they will describe it kind of like a feeling of um, impending doom. They don't really know why they feel anxious. They can't relate it to anything. They just feel anxious. Um, sedation is the loss of awareness and reaction to environmental stimuli. So this condition may be desirable um, if we have patients who are restless, if they're nervous, if they're irritable, or if they're overreacting to a stimuli. Um, sedation would be, um, there's different types of sedation. So if you're having general anesthesia, then you would have total sedation where you're completely um, 
um, put out and you don't remember anything. Um, sometimes we want to sedate people. Maybe they're just having, um, you know, maybe they're going to have surgery and they're just a little bit nervous about it. So then you just give them something to take the edge off. Makes them a little sleepy and makes them just forget about what's going on. And then you have hypnosis. So this is extreme sedation, which results in um, further ner central nervous system depression and sleep. Um, they're used to help people fall asleep by causing sedation. And the drugs that are effective hypnotics act on that reticulator acti um, activating system. We call it the RAS. And they work by blocking the brain's response to incoming stimuli so they don't know what's going on. So these are the sites where we're going to see these medications work. Um, you can look at this book. It, um, you can look at this slide in your book. It shows you where the reticulator active um, system is right there. There's the cerebellum. And then um, right here, it's going to show you where these um, benzodiazepines work. Um, you can read more about it in your book. It goes into a lot more detail. I'm not going to quiz you on anything like that, but you can look at it if you want to. So benzodiazepines, how do they work? They act in the limbic system of the brain and that reticular activating system to make GABA more effective, which interferes with neuron firing. This leads to an anxiolytic effect at doses lower than those required to induce sedation and hypnosis. When would we give these medications? We would give them to patients who have anxiety disorders. Um, we give them to prevent anxiety because they don't cause, they're not associated with um, a lot of sedation. We give these medications to patients who are withdrawing from alcohol. It helps limit their signs and symptoms that we see. So um, unlike certain drugs, you can withdraw from them and not die. With alcohol, you cannot. So if you have a patient that's been drinking for a long time and they're going through withdrawal, they can have a seizure and they can die. So it's really important that you are doing those, what we call CWAs, um, it's where we look at our patients signs and symptoms and vital signs every four hours and we every for every symptom that they have or every vital sign that we check it gives them a number based upon what their reaction is and if they score a certain number then we have to give them a certain medication um, to help decrease those symptoms and to prevent them from having a seizure and dying. Um, we can also use it for hyperexcitability or agitation. And then we can do preoperative relief of anxiety and tension. Um, so again, patients sometimes are very, very anxious about having a procedure, they're very tense. So this just helps to relax them a little bit. And then when they have their anxiety, it kind of builds on that and it helps to put them out. So pharmacokinetics. So benzodiazepines are well absorbed in the GI tract. Um, peak levels usually are achieved in 30 minutes to two hours. They are lipid soluble um, and well distributed throughout the body. They do cross the placenta and they enter breast milk. Um, the benzodiazepines are metabolized extensively in the liver. Um, patients with liver disease have to receive smaller doses and you wanna make sure you're monitoring them closely. So, these patients are going to be your alcoholic patients. So patients come in, they're withdrawing from alcohol, their en liver enzymes are going to be elevated because they're alcoholics. Um, so you're going to want to give them the medications, but then you're going to want to monitor those um, labs every day. And then excretion is primarily through the urine. So what else do you think you're going to have to monitor? Kidneys. Kidneys. Yep, you got it. All right. So contradictions to giving these medications. So obviously we would not wanna give it to any patient that's had an allergy to any benzodiazepine in the past because we wanna prevent those hypersensitivity reactions. Um, yeah. 
if they have a history of any psychosis, you want to be careful with that because sometimes um, these benzodiazepines can have an exacerbation like effect on them and make the psychosis work, I mean, worse. Um, patients ha who have acute narrow angle glaucoma, you want to give it um, cautiously in those patients. Um, coma, acute alcoholic intoxications, um, all of these can be exacerbated by um, depressive effects of these drugs. So. Yes, Davis. Davis. Ryan, Ryan is waiting to get back in. Yes, I just let him back in, I think. Okay, so you wanna use these cautiously um, in pregnant women. We said earlier that they do cross the, um, the placenta and they do enter the breast milk. So there are um, some um, medication books say that there is a um, possibility that if you use this when you're pregnant, that the child could be born with um, a cleft lip or a cleft palate. Um, they could also have inguinal hernias or maybe even some um, heart issues. They could have microcephaly. And even um, some children have been born with pyloric stenosis. Um, so taking these medications in the first trimester is not recommended. Um, if the parents take it through pregnancy, especially towards the end, the neonatal might go through withdrawal and have to stay in the hospital a little bit longer, and then they're gonna to have to wean the baby off the medication as well. Um, breastfeeding, you would not wanna give these um, medications to a mother who's breastfeeding because it goes through the milk. Um, all of these drugs now come with a black box warning. Um, a, black spot, a black box warning is a type of warning that's going to appear on the insert um, for certain medications. Um, it comes from the Food and Drug Administration. So the warnings that it has, they call it a black box warning because it's going to have a specific warning and it's going to be surrounded literally in a black box. It's the strongest warning that the FDA can make. Um, and it signifies that medical studies on that drug carry a significant risk of serious or life-threatening adverse effects. So this is a black box warning drug. Um, you want to be careful when you're giving these to your patients because they can produce profound um, sedation. They can cause respiratory distress, coma or death. Um, you always wanna use the smallest dosage possible. Dosage should be limited and your patients should be monitored closely. So when you give these, um, some of these you'll give IV, some of these are PO. You're gonna make sure you check those blood pressures before you give it. You're gonna check, make sure you check their respirations and their pulse because if they're already low, you don't want to um, give them these medications. You're gonna to wanna to ask the doctor to order something else. Um, that's not going to have so such a profound effect on their vital signs. So some of the um, adverse effects that you will see are sedation, drowsiness, depression, lethargy. They might have blurred vision. They might be confused. Um, you see this a lot of times in, um, in older adults. They're very, very, very sensitive to these medications. You have to use them very cautiously. Um, and some doctors won't even order them because they have a hard time with them. Dry mouth, constipation. Whenever you think benzo, whenever you think any kind of narcotics or benzodiazepines like this, barbiturates, you want to think: are, should they have a stool softener? Um, they should have one on hand because it does cause constipation. You want to um, increase their fluid intake because their risk of constipation. Um, Sometimes you will give these medications at the same time as you give an anti-nausea medication because they cause nausea and vomiting. So if you've already given it to your patient once before and you know that they got nauseated or they vomited from it, you might want to um, make sure that the doctor orders some Zofran and give that to them about 10 minutes before you give them this medication. And that way it can help prevent some of those symptoms. Um, it's gonna, it can cause hypotension and then urinary retention. So a lot of side effects for you guys to watch for. Drug interactions, um, there is a risk of CNS depression if you take benzodiazepines with alcohol or other CNS depression such as opioids. So you wanna educate your patients to avoid that. 
Um, there also is um, an increase in the effect when uh, the benzodiazepines, if you take them with um, cimetidine, which is an acid reducer for the stomach, um, if the patient is on oral contraceptives, oral contraceptives, or if they take um, the Solifram. So that is a medication that we give to patients who are alcoholics. Um, when they take this medication, if they drink alcohol while they're taking it, it's going to make them deathly ill. They're going to feel like they have the flu. They're going to be vomiting. They're going to have diarrhea. Um, it keeps them from, it keeps them, it is, it's a deterrent to keep them from drinking. Um, so they definitely do not want to take those two medications together. Um, and then the impact of benzodiazepines can be decreased if you take them with theophylines. And those are your medications that patients take for asthma, um, COPD, and then patients that have emphysema. So these are some of the most popular benzodiazepines. You have um, alprazolam, which is Xanax. Then we have clonopin. Clonopin is also given as a blood pressure medication. You'll see it given, um, usually if your patient is on a multitude of blood pressure medication, they will add this if no other blood pressure medicines are working. We have Librium, Valium, you guys have probably heard about that, Ativan, um, Restoril, and then Trizolam. So those are some of the more popular ones. So now we're going to talk about barbiturates. So they are CNS depressants also that inhibit that inhibit neural um, impulse conduction in that ascending RAS system. They, depre they depress the cerebral cortex, they alter cerebular function, and they depress motor output. They can cause patients to um, be sedated. They can put them in a state of hypnosis. Um, they use it during anesthesia. And in extreme cases, it can put patients into um, a coma. All right, so when would we give our patients barbiturates? So they are indicated for the relief of the signs and symptoms of anxiety, um, sometimes for sedation, um, insomnia, pre-anesthesia, so before they go into um, actually go under anesthesia, and for the treatment of seizures. So it has on this slide that it is used for anxiety. So I want you guys to understand that we don't, it's no longer considered the mainstay drug for anxiety. Um, it is indicated in the drug book that you can use it for that, and you can, but it's not widely used. Um, they used to be for a long time, but the adverse effects associated with them for um, the treatment of anxiety is not, um, it, the benefit's not worth the risk. So there's an increased risk of physical tolerance to the drug, and there's also an increased risk of psychological dependence to this medication. And then certain hypersensitivities can be fatal. So for the um, for recommendation of anxiety, we do not see that we are recommending this drug anymore. I want you guys to remember that, okay? Pharmacokinetics, it's very well absorbed in the GI tract. It reaches peak levels within 20 to 60 minutes. Um, they are metabolized in the liver, um, depending on the drug, and it's excreted in the urine. Patients with hepatic or renal dysfunction require lower doses um, in order to avoid those toxic effects. And as nurses, you want to be monitoring the patient closely and looking at those labs. So you're going to look at BUN, creatinine, AST, ALT. The AST and ALT are your liver functions. The BUN and the creatinine are your kidney functions. Barbiturates are lipid soluble. They readily cross the placenta and enter the breast milk. So what do you think, what is some teaching you're going to do with, um, with those patients? Don't take it if you're breastfeeding or pregnant. Pregnant, you got it. Hold on, I'm just letting some more people in. Um, okay. So when would we not want to give barbiturates? So 
We would not want to give this if they had an allergy to any barbiturate in the past because we want to avoid those hypersensitivity reactions. If they have a previous previous history of addiction to any sedative or hypnotic drugs because these barbiturates are much more addicting than the anxiolytics. Um, they have any liver disorders, so that latent or manifest um, porphyria, that's a liver disorder, it can cause an exacerbation, any marked hepatic impairment or nephritis, um, because this is gonna alter the metabolism and excretion of these drugs. Um, respiratory distress or severe respiratory dysfunction because it can be exacerbated by the CNS depression that are caused by those drugs. And then pregnancy is a contraindication um, because of the adverse effects of the pregnancy. There are congenital abnormalities that have been reported with using barbiturates when you are pregnant. So some adverse reactions. Um, the adverse effects that we see with barbiturates are much more severe than those associated with other medications. Some of the newer um, sedative hypnotics um, are no, are, so for that reason, um, the newer ones are the ones that we're seeing not so much of, um, of these issues with, but the older ones that we used to use are more, we see a lot more of these side effects. So they've come a long way. So CNS depression, that physical dependency, um, drowsiness, lethargy, ataxia, vertigo, the nausea, the vomiting, constipation. Drug to drug interactions. Um, so you're gonna worry about CNS depression if these agents are taken with other medications that depress the CNS system, including alcohol, certain antihistamines, so Benadryl, other certain types of tranquilizers. Um, there is an altered response to um, um, phenytoin if it's combined with um, barbiturates. So you wanna make sure that if the patient is ordered this combination that you wanna to talk to the pharmacist and see if you can order it for a different time of day, maybe early in the morning for one, late in the evening for another, or you can ask the doctor to just, um, maybe one of these medications can be discontinued and they can find uh, a safer substitute for one of the medications. Um, if you take a barbiturate with an MAO inhibitor, which is an antidepressant, it can increase um, the serum, le serum levels of the barbiturate um, and cause a worse reaction. And then because of the effects on the liver, um, there's a list of drugs that might not be as effective. So these would be your um, oral anticoagulants, digoxin, which is ordered for, um, it regulates your heart rate, um, certain tricyclic antidepressants, um, corticosteroids that we would give for infections, um, oral contraceptives, estrogens, um, acetaminophen, metronidazole, which is an antibiotic, carbamazepine, and then you have beta blockers. So those are your medications that we give for hypertension. So some of the most common barbiturates are your phenobarbital, your butobarbital, and secobarbital. The main ones that I've really seen that I've ever given are the phenobarbital. Never really given the other ones. All right, so antidepressant agents. So the signs and symptoms of depression. So depression is a very common affective disorder. Um, it involves the feelings of sadness that are much more severe and longer lasting than just the um, time that you anticipate that they would be. Um, it affects the mood of people who are depressed much more intensely than it does people who don't suffer from depression. Um, Scientists have examined depression for many, 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 many years. They believe, um, they theorize that um, depression results from a deficiency in what we call biogenic amines in key areas of the brain. So these biogenic amines include um, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. There's just three of them. So norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. You guys will see that 
information again. So I want you guys to make note of that. Um, it's also in your book. Um, so these um, biogenic amines, what they do is they're, they are released throughout the brain by certain neurons. They work with multiple receptors in the body. They help regulate um, your alertness, your attention, your mood, um, your appetite, and how you process different sensories. Um, patients who have um, might report to you that are depressed that they have very little energy that they just don't feel like they wanna do what they used to do. They've lost um, the drive to do things that they really enjoy. So maybe they normally um, play softball every spring, but they just don't feel like doing it anymore. It's something they really love, or they used to you know, bowl on a bowling league, but they don't even wanna do that anymore. Um, they might report sleep disturbances, having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep. Um, they, might lose, they might not be able to sleep for days on end. They might say that they have a lack of appetite, they have a limited libido, um, that they have a hard time even just doing their simple activities of daily living. So it could be their, um, you know, getting dressed in the morning. Maybe they don't shower every day. They used to, but now they're lucky if they shower once a week. They don't want to get dressed. They don't want to go to the store, things like that. Um, they might say that they feel um, very, very sad, that they feel hopeless, that they're very disorganized. These are some of the things that patients might report. Um, in many cases, depression is never diagnosed. The patient is just treated for the physical manifestations, um, such as, you know, they'll say that they're really tired, that they have body aches, um, they gain weight, or they're anorexic, they don't have, you know, they don't want to eat, maybe they have a drug dependence now or an alcoholism, but they're not actually, um, they never really get to the bottom of why all they're experiencing all these issues because of the depression. Um, clinical depression is a disorder that can interfere with a person's life, it can interfere with their job, um, social actions, interactions with their friends, with their loved ones. Um, left untreated, it can produce a multiple physical problems that can lead, that's going to cause even further depression and unfortunately even suicide sometimes because they just can't see, um, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. So actions of antidepressant therapy. So they alter the concentration of neurotransmitters in the brain. And they believe that's the most effective means of treating depression is with medications. Um, the antidepressant drugs that we use today counteract the effects of the neurotransmitter deficiencies in three different ways. So first, they inhibit the effects of um, MAO, which is going to lead to um, NE or 5-HT in the synaptic class. So these are like um, proteins or enzymes that are secreted. So they're gonna cause them to be increased. Second, they block the reuptake of these neurotransmitters by releasing nerves, leading to increased neurotransmitter levels in the synaptic cleft, the cleft. And then third, they regulate receptor sites and the breakdown of neurotransmitters, leading to an accumulation of neurotransmitters neurotrans in the synaptic cleft. So I'm not going to ask you any questions about this. Um, I just, they want, we just want you to know how it actually works in the body. Um, another thing to think about these drugs is that we do prescribe them for children, um, adolescents. Um, the response of how they actually work in children is not known. They've done a lot of research on it, but it's still, um, it's a very big challenge when they prescribe antidepressant medicines to children. Um, the way that the children react to the drug is very unpredictable. And then the long-term effects that these agents are gonna have on children is not clearly understood. Studies have not shown um, efficacy in using these drugs to treat depression in children. And they also indicate that there's an increase in suicidal ideation and suicidal behavior when antidepressants when antidepressants are used to treat depression in children. So that's an important slide. I want you guys to pay attention to that, okay? So we have a couple different classes of antidepressants. We have um, tricyclic antidepressants, we call them TSAs. 
We have the monomine oxidase inhibitors, the MAOs, and then we have um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs. So listed in your book is this slide where the site of action is for these antidepressants. Um, the, MAO, the MAOIs work to prevent the breakdown of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. The TSAs are going to work to block the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. And the SSRIs work to specifically block the reuptake of serotonin. So first, we're going to talk about tricyclic antidepressants. These reduce the reuptake of 5-HT and NE into the nerves. Because all of the TSAs are similarly effective, the choice um, of the TSA prescribed depends depends on an individual response to the drug and the tolerance of the adverse effects. A person that doesn't respond to one of these TSA drugs may respond to another. So this is the thing with um, antidepressant drugs. It takes about a good four weeks of patients taking these medications before you actually see um, a change in their attitude or they notice an act where they can actually notice or we can actually notice a change. And not all of these medications work. Some of them have unpleasant side effects. Some of them don't have any, but they don't have the they don't achieve the effect that we want them to achieve. So it is sometimes a process. Um, you might have to try many different medications, and this is something that you want to explain to your patients and educate them because they're already in a depressed state. Um, they may lose sight of the goal if they have to keep changing medications. So you want them to understand that this is part of the process. Um, there's a lot of medications we can use, and I'm sure there's ultimately one that will be a good fit for them, but it's not always the first or the second one we try. Sometimes it is, and that's great. Um, TSAs are indicated for the relief of symptoms of, depress of depression. The sedative effects of these drugs may make them more effective in patients whose depression is characterized by anxiety and sleep disturbances. So if you have a patient that reports, I don't get any sleep, I'm really anxious, I'm constantly thinking about this or that and the other, this is probably a good group to start with because it does have that sedative effect that will help them relax and be able to sleep and feel less anxious. Um, some of these drugs are being investigated for the treatment of chronic and intractable pain. So what we talked before about medications that were designed to have one effect, but then after they've used them, they notice that, oh, they're effective for this too. So um, these tricyclic antidepressants are um, one of those categories. So these are a type that many different, uh, some of the types of um, tricyclic antidepressants. So we have um, the amines, amitriptyline, amoxapine, clonipramine, doxapine, amipramine, and trimipramine. These are all oral pills. Um, if your patient is on an antidepressant medication, they're going to be taking an oral pill. It's not something that we give IV or through an injection or anything like that. I want you guys to know that they're all oral pills. So the TSAs are well absorbed in the GI tract. <clears throat> they reach peak levels in about two to four hours. They are highly bound to plasma proteins and are lipid soluble. So this allows them to be distributed widely in the tissues, including the brain. They're metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine with relatively long half-lives, arranging from eight to 46 hours. So if you have a patient, an older patient who has liver issues or kidney issues and the long half-life is eight to 46 hours, this might not be a good combination for that patient. Um, something to think about. The TSAs do cross the placenta and enter the breast milk again. So you're going to anticipate that these are not recommended for your patients who are pregnant or breastfeeding. One contradiction to using these TSAs is the presence of an allergy to any of the drugs, because again, you're going to want to avoid that hypersensitivity reaction. Um, Recent myocardial, if the patient has had a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, because there is a potential for the occurrence of another um, infarction or the extension of the infarction that they've already had, 
um, with cardiac effects of the drug. If the patient has had a myelograph within the past 24 hours or in the next 48 hours, if they're gonna have one, there is a drug to drug reaction with these um, antidepressants depressants and the dyes that we use in these studies. Um, any concurrent use of an MAOI because of the serious um, adverse effects or toxic reactions. Um, TSA should not be used unless the benefit to the mother clearly outweighs the risk of the potential to the neonate. Um, so any adverse effects that we see from the TSAs are associated with the effects of the um, drug on the central nervous system. We want to use cautiously in patients with cardiovascular disease, angle closure at glaucoma, uh, if they have urinary retention or manic depres um, depression. They may lead to GI anticholinergic effects such, such as dry mouth. Um, constipation, they could be nauseated, they might vomit, they might have a loss of appetite, um, increased salivation, cramps, diarrhea, um, urinary retention, um, hesitancy, so that means that they have, they kind of have like trouble starting a stream when they have to urinate, um, loss of libido, changes in sexual function, the cardiovascular effects you're going to see are some orthostatic hypotension, um, they could also have hypertension, they could have cardiac arrhythmias, um, they could have a heart attack, they could have angina, um, heart palpitations, and stroke. Um, some patients that use this have reported effects with alopecia, so they've lost their hair. Um, weight gain is, or loss is something that you see with these medications. Normally, weight gain is what I see. Um, they might report flushing. They might report um, nasal congestion. Um, let's see. If these medications are given with MAIOs, um, simidine, Guaxetine, ranitidine, this can cause an increase um, in the TCA levels, which results with an increase in both therapeutic and adverse effect. Um, so especially with those anticholinergic conditions, they're going to be a lot worse. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you monitor them closely, and then you want to um, appropriately change the dose as necessary. So when you are um, talking to your patients, you're gathering that assessment data. Some of the things that you wanna think about if they're on this medication are, do they have a history of any suicide attempts? Do they have any GI issues? Um, you wanna make sure you take their temperature and their weight. Um, you wanna look at their skin color and note any lesions. Um, you wanna look at their affect. So what is their affect? Do they smile in response to you? Do they look away? Do they um, not interact with you? Um, do they seem like they're on edge or super, super relaxed? What's their orientation status? Um, you wanna check their reflex. You're gonna monitor their blood pressure, um, including that orthostatic blood pressure. Um, you're gonna check their pulse and their perfusion. You're gonna check their respiratory rate. Um, you wanna monitor for any advantageous lung sounds. And then you're gonna listen for bowel sounds. Um, so these are all in um, response to the adverse side effects that we can see. Um, again, when we give these medications to children, um, they can cause an ad, they can cause um, suicidal ideations. So you're going to want to make sure that you're assessing: do you, have you had a history of any suicide attempts? Do you have any suicidal ideations now? Do you feel like you're at risk for hurting yourself? Do you feel safe? These are the things you're going to want to ask them. And that is important information. You guys might want to know that slide. So your MAIOs, MAOIs, sorry, these irreversibly inhibit MAO, which is an enzyme that we find in our nerves and other tissues like our liver. It helps break down those biogenic amines, that norepinephrine, the dopamine, um, and the 5-HT, and it helps to relieve depression. It allows, um, ser it allows serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine to accumulate in the synaptic cleft. 
They are generally indicated for the treatment and signs and symptoms of depression in patients who cannot tolerate or do not respond to other safer antidepressants. So this is not the first class of medication that would be chosen to treat a patient with depression. This is the patient who's gone through multiple um, antidepressants and they have not seen any relief. They are well absorbed from the GI tract. They reach peak levels in two to three hours. Um, they're metabolized in the liver and they're excreted in the urine. Patients with liver or renal impairment and those known as slow um, acylators may require lower doses to avoid exaggerated effects of the drugs. These also cross over the placenta and enter breast milk. Contradiction. So we would not give an MAOI if a patient has previously had an allergy to any of these antidepressants because we don't want that hypersensitivity reaction. Um, if they've had um, if they've had a history of phenochromatomia um, or any kind of cardiovascular disease because the sudden increase in those NE levels could cause severe hypertension and it could cause a cardiovascular emergency because the blood pressure raises so high. Um, you also would want to use cautiously in patients who have a history of migraines or headaches um, because headaches is a um, side effect of these medications. Um, Again, you're going to use cautiously with patients who um, have renal or hepatic impairment. It can cause, um, the, it can slow down the metabolism and the excretion of these drugs and allow the drug to accumulate, which can cause toxic levels. Um, you would not want to use these medications if your patient had a myelography within the past 24 hours, or if they're going to have one in the next 48 hours, because we said earlier, they have that reaction with the dye and the medication. Um, MAOIs are, you, are associated with adverse side effects. Um, more, you'll see more of these side effects that are fatal than with other antidepressants. That's why these are not you, um, the first choice to be used. Um, the effects that we see are related to that accumulation of the um, NE in the synaptic cleft. So you're gonna see dizziness, um, overexcitement, nervousness, sometimes mania, hyperreflexia. Your patient could have tremors, they could be confused. Um, insomnia, they won't be able to sleep. They might be agitated. They might report blurred vision, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. I mean, there's so many side effects. Constipation, anorexia, which is that loss of appetite, weight gain, dry mouth, abdominal pain, urinary retention, dysuria, um, incontinence, changes in sexual function, and then those cardiovascular effects that we're gonna see. That's gonna be your orthostatic hypotension, your arrhythmias, um, the patient might report palpitations, angina, um, and potentially a hypertensive crisis. Hypertensive crisis can be fatal because the blood pressure goes up so high so quickly and sometimes it's uncontrolled and the patient can actually die. It's pretty serious. Drug to drug interactions. Um, any other antidepressants that can cause a hypertensive crisis, it can cause a coma. Um, methyldopia, which is a, simp a simpa, Thomometic effects, it's going to cause an increase in those effects. If your patient is on insulin or um, any oral anti diabetic agents, it can um, cause hypoglycemia. And then there will be food interactions um, with tyramine or presuramine. Those two um, used together, those foods with um, the MAOIs can cause an increase in the blood pressure. Not the hypertensive crisis, but just an increase in blood pressure. So um, what are some of the MAOIs that we see? We have parna Parnate, Nardil, and Marplan. Those are the three that are usually um, prescribed, again, not used in patients who did not respond to or could not take um, the newer, safer antidepressants. Um, 
because of the um, adverse effects being so bad and then fatal. That's why this is not the first class of medications that we prescribe. So the SSRIs, these are the newest group of antidepressant medications. They are, um, they specifically block the reuptake of 5-HT and they have little or no effect um, known to on the NE. Um, because SSRIs do not have a lot of the adverse side effects associated with the TCAs and the MAOIs, they are a better choice for many patients. They um, block the reuptake of 5-HT, which increases the levels of 5-HT in that synaptic cleft and can contribute to the antidepressant and other effects that are attributed to these drugs. They're indicated for the treatment of depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic attacks, bulimia, um, premenstrual pre dysphoric disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, social phobias, and social anxiety disorders. I also see them prescribed just for anxiety as well. Um, so when you're, you know, when you are educating your patients when they start to take these antidepressants, Again, you're gonna just wanna remind them that it's gonna take at least four weeks for them to be able to see a change in their, mute, their mood. It takes um, up to four weeks before that drug reaches the full therapeutic effect. Um, so you are not gonna want, to, you're not gonna tell them that they don't, you know, don't stop taking it after two weeks because you don't see anything. Don't stop taking it after three weeks because you think it's not working. Some of these medications will cause you to be dizzy at first. Um, it might cause a dry mouth. Some of their milder effects, you wanna tell them to try and stick with it because they might see it between the, the week one through week four, but usually after week four, those signs and symptoms stop. Um, if they start taking them and they miss a pill for a day or two, those symptoms might come back again. So you might wanna educate that um, point. Um, let's see. Pharmacokinetics, they are well absorbed in the GI tract, metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine and feces. Um, there's many different medications. So the, the half-life of these medications is too wide that we're, gonna, we're not gonna cover them here because each of them have their own um, half-life. They're associated with congenital abnormalities in animal studies. So they are not recommended during the use um, if you're pregnant, only if the benefits to the mother are clearly outweigh the potential risks to the fetus. Um, they are contraindicated in the presence of an allergy to any of these drugs. Again, that hypersensitivity reaction could occur. You're gonna to wanna to use cautiously in patients with renal or hepatic function. It's gonna alter the metabolism and excretion. That medication is gonna build up in their system and cause a toxic effect. Um, patients with diabetes, they, these, these um, side effects can also be exacerbated. And then you should always use caution um, when using these medications with patients who are severely depressed or suicidal, um, especially those children, the adolescents and the young adults because there is an increased risk of um, suicide. So one of the things they say with these drugs is, um, why does it cause them to, in, why does it cause them to kill themselves if that's why we're giving them the medication because they wanna kill themselves to begin with? How does it cause it to be worse? So what happens, what they believe happens in a majority of the patients, not every patient, but when you're depressed and you're not, you know, performing your activities of daily living, you don't have any energy, you're fatigued all the time, you don't have the energy to do anything. You might have those suicidal thoughts but sometimes it's so bad, you don't even have the energy to carry out the act of committing suicide or putting together a plan. So sometimes when they start taking this medication, they start to have energy again. Once they have energy again, then they can start thinking about the, the actual plan and actually committing suicide, and then they can follow through with their plan. So in the majority of people, um, that's why the risk is indicated. Um, 
There are some reports that link SSRIs during pregnancy with pulmonary or cardiac issues with the newborn. Um, the SSRIs can enter the breast milk and cause adverse side effects in the baby. Um, so a, a different method of feeding the baby should be selected if your patient's gonna go on an SSRI. So this would be your patients who are having post, um, um, God, what's it called? I can't think of it. Um, Yes, postpartum disorder, very common. We do treat it with medication. And then unfortunately they are not able to breastfeed anymore depending on the medication that we put them on. Adverse reactions, um, headaches, drowsiness, dizziness, insomnia, anxiety, tremor, agitation, fevers, okay? This is not a side effect that we talked about in the other medications. I want you guys to make note of that. You might see that again somewhere. Um, these group of medications can cause a fever. They can cause a rash um, and some puritis. Um, so you guys should know that. Um, let's see. There is a risk of serotonin syndrome if we use SSRIs with MAOIs. Um, you would not want this combination to be implemented in a patient. Um, they can sometimes, but they, the doctor has to be very careful about the timing. Um, a period of up to six weeks after stopping an SSRI may be needed before they begin therapy with a new medication. So if they're on a couple SSRIs and they don't work, they certainly can try an MAO because remember we said the MAOIs we use if nothing else is effective, but ha they have to wait um, sometimes for a period up to six weeks before they can start that medication. Um, serotonin syndrome is very serious. It can also be fatal. It's a reaction that can occur if the drugs are combined with any other drug or herb that increases levels of 5-HT in the body. Um, so other medications that would cause this, this to happen are other SSRIs, um, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, um, St. John's wort, that is an over-the-counter medication that you can get. Um, certain tryptins, there's an increased risk of bleeding if these drugs are combined with aspirin um, or NSAIDs. Any kind of antiplatelet drug or drugs that affect coagulation. So this might not be a good combination for your patients that have AFib and they're taking warfarin to regulate their, um, you know, their platelet level. Um, if you have a patient that has a back issue and they're taking NSAIDs all the time because they have you know, inflammatory pain, this is probably not a good medication for them. Um, you would want to figure out what the bigger issue is and then they would decide which medication that they would want to discontinue and substitute another medication for. So there are many different SSRIs. Some of the most common ones are listed here. So you have Prozac or fluoxetine. You have the first ever SSRI, which is citalopram, also known as Celexa. Um, you have Lexapro, you have Livox, Paxil, been around for a long time, Zoloft. Zoloft is the newest version of Celexa. Um, Fibrid, and then... Brintelix, Brintelix, sorry. So I'm sure some of you have heard those drugs a time or two. Then there's a couple other miscellaneous types of antidepressants um, that don't fit into the three categories that we talked about. These drugs work and they have a varying effects that, um, that work on the NE, the 5-HT and the dopamine levels in our body. They are known to be very effective in treating depression in patients who do not respond to other antidepressants. Um, they also have a black box warning label because they want you to be alert for the possibility of increased um, suicide, especially in children, adolescent, and young adults um, whenever the drugs are issued. So these are your Wellbutrin or Zyban. These are your Remeron. Um, Serzone, Deseril, and Effexor. So then we have your psychotherapeutic agents. 
So these are used to treat psychosis, per, um, perceptual and behavioral disorders. These psychotherapeutic agents are ta targeted at the thought processes rather than the affective states. Although they do not cure psychotic disorders, psychotherapeutic agents do help both adult and pediatric patients function in a more acceptable manner. And that way they are able to carry out their activities of daily living. They're able to function um, in the day-to-day -day life. So the issues are still gonna be there, but the medication helps manage them. These are the sites where these medications will work. We have a couple different classifications of antipsychotics. So we have typical and atypical. Typical antipsychotic drugs block dopamine receptors. So they prevent the stimulation of the postsynaptic neurons by dopamine. Typical antipsychotics include Thorazine, Proxylin, um, Haldol, that's going to be one that you guys are going to see all the time in the, in your, um, wherever you work. Um, Loxt Loxetan, Trilofan, ORAP. Um, let's see. Those are probably the most common ones. You're either going to see Thorazine or Haldol. Those are the most prominent ones. There are newer atypical antipsychotics that block both the dopamine and the serotonin receptors. This dual action helps to alleviate some of the unpleasant neurological effects and the depression that are associated with these typical antipsychotics. Your atypical antipsychotics are going to include your Abilify, um, Latuda, Zyprexa. Zyprexa is a medication that I give all the time. Um, Seroquel, also another medication you give all the time. So Abilify, Seroquel, Zyprexa, Risperidol is going to be one that you see all the time, and Geodon. Those are the most frequently um, ordered medications that we see. This is a list of all those medications that I just talked about. I didn't mention every single one. I just mentioned the most um, important ones that you might see. What are the problems with these medications? Well, some of these medications exhibit extra pyramidal side effects. Um, Haldol is one of the medications that exhibits these um, extra pyramidal side effects. This is important for you guys to know. You're gonna see this information again. This is an adverse effect associated with these medications and it's related to the dopamine blocking and anticholinergic um, effects, um, antihistamine effects and alpha adrenergic activities. The most common side effects that we're gonna see are sedation, weakness, um, sometimes tremors and then drowsiness. These um, extra pyramidal side effects are gonna be, um, so you might see pseudo Parkinsonism. So pseudo Parkinsonism are symptoms that resemble Parkinsonism. So they don't really have Parkinson's, but the, they're gonna distribute, they're gonna just, um, they're gonna exhibit signs of Parkinson's disease. So they're gonna have tremors. Um, they might have a mask-like face where they just stare and they don't have any expression. They might be drooling from one side of their mouth. They could be very stiff and rigid. Um, their gait could be very, very stiff. They could have dystonia. Dystonia is a movement disorder in which all the muscles in your body contract involuntarily. And what's going to happen is you're going to have repetitive, the patient's going to be having twisting-like movements and they're going to be repetitive. They're going to keep happening over and over again. Um, Akathisia, which makes it hard for you to stand still, and you're just going to be moving all over the place. They can have tardive dyskinesia. Um, tardive dyskinesia is when, um, which is right on here, it's a neurological condition um, <clears throat> characterized by involuntary repetitive muscle movements. So this facial, um, that you, these facial issues that you see right here are very common. You'll also see patients that have taken these medications for a long time, their tongue will be just hanging out of the side of their mouth. Um, sometimes their tongue comes all the way out of their mouth and it hangs out, it's really long. Sometimes you'll just see a part of it, it might be off to the side, um, but when you see it, you know it. Um, 
some of these side effects can be irreversible. Um, one of the side effects that's irreversible are neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So this is where the patient has a very high fever. They're, um, they can get very rigid muscles and they can have a rapid heartbeat. So again, Haldol or haloperidol is a typical antipsychotic drug. Um, if anyone asked you what the adverse effect of, these, of that drug is, what are you gonna say? Any of them? I mean, you could say any of those, right? You could say any of them, but what's the big one that I told you that you guys are gonna see? The pseudoparkinism. Park well, it could be any one of those. So it's going to be there. So that the umbrella term is the extra pyramidal effects. And under that is any one of these different things. But you should just recognize that Haldol can cause these extra pyramidal effects. Okay. And then the extra pyramidal effects are any one of these. They might have one of them. They could have all of them. Or they might not get any of them at all. But they are, that drug has a high risk of exhibiting these issues. Okay. So antipsychotic and neuroleptic drugs, they block dopamine receptors. They prevent the stimulation of the postsynaptic neurons by dopamine. They depress the RAS system, limiting the stimuli that is able to come into the brain. They also have anticholinergic, antihistamine, and alpha adrogenic blocking effects. Um, all of these are going to be related to the blocking of the dopamine receptor sites. Some of the newer atypical antipsychotic drugs block both the dopamine and the serotonin receptors. Um, the antipsychotics are indicated for patients who have schizophrenia um, and for certain manifestations of other psychotic disorders, such as hyperactivity, um, patients that have combative disorder, or combative behaviors, um, severe behavioral problems in children. We would only use this on short term, for short term control only. This is not a long term, these are not long term medications that would you, you would use in children. Some of them are also approved for the treatment of bipolar disorder. They are absorbed from the GI tract. They offer, unlike some of the other ones that only offer oral, we can give an IM dose. So when we give an IM dose, this provides four to five times the active dose as oral doses. Um, you would be given an IM dose to a patient who is severely combative, very, very confused. Um, some of these patients are gonna be in your psych units. If they're not, if they're on your floor, they probably need a bed in a psych unit if you're giving them Halidol because it's really, it's gonna knock them out quickly. Um, so these are your patients who are combative. They're pulling their lines out. They're hitting the staff. They're hurting the staff. They're in a complete danger to themselves and the staff. Um, it's widely distributed throughout the tissues, metabolized in the liver, excreted through bile and urine, and it crosses the placenta and enters the breast milk. Um, they are contraindicated in the presence of underlying diseases that could be exacerbated by the dopamine blocking effects. And they're also contraindicated in conditions which could be exacerbated by the drugs. Um, so when the central nervous system or that cause CNS, CS, CNS, CNS depression, God, I can't speak. So some contraindications, so patients that have circulatory collapse, your Parkinson's patients, um, why do you think you wouldn't wanna give this to a patient that has Parkinson's? What do you think is gonna happen? What could happen to them? So we said that these patients, if we give them Halidol, they could have extra pyramidal effects, right? One of them is that they might have symptoms of Parkinson's. If they have Parkinson's, would we wanna give them a medication that's gonna increase their the side effects? No, because we give them medication every day to control those symptoms, but then we're gonna go and give them Haldol and it's gonna cause all those symptoms again. So we don't wanna do that. Um, coronary artery disease, severe hypotension, and then patients who have bone marrow suppression. So these would be your chemo patients, HIV patients, patients who take immunocompromising um, medications, 
Antipsychotics are contraindicated for use in elderly patients with dementia because this is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events and death. Um, it does cause prolongation of the QT interval, and it's a con contradiction to the use of some of these meds. So thoridiazine is one, um, zyprazidone is one, um, they all can cause further prolonging of that QT interval. You would see this on an, an EKG. Um, and when that QT interval is long like that and it's extended, it can cause you to have a stroke. Um, it can cause a deadly arrhythmia. So sometimes if the doctor is gonna order Haldol for your patient, um, maybe they've tried other medications that don't work and Haldol is their only option. I've seen that happen before. They will have you do an EKG on the patient first so that you can make sure they have a normal EKG um, so that you can make sure that that QT interval is where it's supposed to be. Because if it's not, then they won't prescribe that medication. Most common side effects that we see are sedation and weakness. And that's really what you wanna do in your patient that's being combative. You wanna calm them down and keep them in the bed and keep them from abusing you. So these are not, you're not gonna give Haldol to your sweet little old lady who just keeps trying to get out of bed. You can use um, restraints on her, you can use a sitter. These are your patients who are like beating up the staff threatening to hurt themselves, ripping out everything, trying to destroy the room. Um, that's when you wanna use Haldol. So some of the adverse reactions are tremors, drowsiness, those extrapyramidal effects, dry mouth, nasal congestion, constipation. Um, you don't wanna use if the patient's taking a beta blocker, which is a hypertensive medication, um, if they've been drinking alcohol um, in combination with that, um, thioridazine and uh, mesoridazine. I know I murder these medications every time I say them. I hate repeat, I never know how to say them. I always, they always give two and I always choose the one that's the easiest to pronounce. Um, and then monitoring that QT interval. Drugs that we use to treat mania and bipolar disease. So we're gonna use lithium salts. We're gonna use Lamactyl, Zyprexa, and Seroquel. So what is the action of lithium? It alters sodium transport in nerve and muscle cells. It inhibits the release of norepinephrine and dopamine, but not serotonin um, from those um, neurons. It increases the intraneuronal stores of norepinephrine and dopamine ever so slightly, and it decreases intraneuronal content of the second messengers. Our anti-manic drugs. So lithium is readily absorbed from the GI tract. It reaches peak levels in 60 minutes, and 30 minutes, I'm sorry, to three hours. This medication follows the same distribution pattern in the body as water. So it's gonna go intracellular, extracellular. It slowly crosses the blood-brain barrier, and lithium is excreted from the kidney. Um, about 80% is gonna be reabsorbed. So during periods of sodium depletion or dehydration, so if you have a patient that is fluid overloaded, which means that their sodium levels are gonna be low, um, or dehydration, which means they're not gonna have a lot of water in their system, so their sodium levels are gonna go high, the kidneys reabsorb more lithium into the serum. To the serum. When this happens, toxic levels build up. So what do you think that you would want to monitor in your patient? What lab do you think you're gonna to wanna to look at? What electrolyte do you think you're gonna to wanna to monitor? Sodium. Sodium. Yep. Very good. I want you guys to remember that you're going to see that information again. So in your patients that have fluid overload, they have a lot of excess fluid. It might be your congestive heart failure patient um, or your patient that comes in that's dehydrated. They're not drinking all the time before you um, 
give them that lithium in the morning, you're gonna to wanna to pull those labs and see what those sodium levels look like. Because if not, the, kid the kidneys are gonna reabsorb more lithium into the blood serum and those toxic levels are gonna um, increase and it's gonna hurt your patient. Um, so you're also going to want to do a lot of education and tell your patients to maintain hydration while taking this drug. Um, it crosses the placenta, enters the breast milk. It has been associated with congenital abnormalities. Um, you're going to want to use cautiously in patients that have had an allergy to this medication, any renal cardiac issues, um, leukemia patients, patients with any metabolic disorders like um, um, diabetes, pregnancy, women who are lactating. Um, so let's see, what else? All right, I think that's all I wanted to tell you about that. All right, so the adverse effects that we see that are associated with lithium are directly related to the serum levels of the drug. So we want to be, we want to have a certain level of this drug in the system to be productive, um, but we don't want too much. So for patients that have acute mania, the guidelines that we look at is when we pull these serum levels, we want to have a level of between 0.5 to 1.5. So if this medication is prescribed for acute mania, that's the drug level that you want, 0.5 to 1.5. If you have a patient that is on long-term control, so they're taking um, this medication all the time, then the level's a little bit higher. You're looking at 0.6 to 1.2. Um, when those serum levels start creeping up, so when you are, or when they're less than 1.5, um, let's start at the bottom actually and work up. So serum levels greater than 2.5, you're gonna have multi-organ toxicity. There's gonna be a very high risk of death. Um, serum levels between two to 2.5. So you're gonna have a progression of those um, CNS effects. So those chronic movements, ataxia, hyperreflexia, patient is gonna possibly have seizures. Um, possible cardiovascular effects that you can see. Um, if you did an EKG, you might see EKG changes. They might've had a normal EKG before and now it's abnormal. They might have hypotension. Um, they might have large output of dilute urine, which is gonna be secondary to toxicity to the kidneys. Um, and then you might see fatalities secondary to pulmonary toxicity. Um, levels 1.5 to 2, you're gonna have in, um, intensification of all the foregoing reactions with ECG changes. Um, and then levels less than 1.5, um, you could see lethargy, you can see slurred speech, you might have muscle weakness. Um, there might be fine tremors, they might have polyuria. Um, this is gonna to relate to the renal toxicity, the effects on the kidneys. Um, and then the beginning of gastric toxicity. So you might see nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So what are the drugs that are um, prescribed for anti-manic patients? So um, Halperidol, carbamazine, and thiazide diuretics. These are going to um, cause issues. So if you're giving them a drug, if you're giving them one of the drugs, if you're giving lithium or any of the other drugs with um, Haldol, you're gonna have um, an interaction. If they are taking um, carbamazine with lithium, you might see an, inter an interaction there. And then if they're on a thiazide diuretic, you're gonna definitely watch them because that is gonna affect their sodium level because um, we're pulling fluid out of their body, it's a diuretic. So we're trying to take fluid out. So you're gonna to wanna to know that the sodium level is gonna be affected and you're gonna to wanna to monitor that. So the site of action of the central nervous system stimulants, they are going to work on, in the brainstem um, in the um, reticular formation. And you can, this slide is actually in your book if you wanna take a look at it. 
So the CNS stimulants act as cortical and cortical and RAS stimulants. They increase the release of catecholamines from the presynaptic neurons. They lead to an increase in stimulation of the postsynaptic neurons. They are clinically used clinically to treat attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, and narcolepsy. So you can have attention deficit by itself, or you can have ADHD, so attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Um, these drugs also carry a black box warning, um, and they that warning states that it is not approved as a weight loss agent. Um, a lot of these medications do cause a loss of appetite and significant weight loss is reported with taking these medications. Um, and they also want you to know that these, stimulate, that these stimulants are indicated as part as a comprehensive treatment program. So that means that yes, it's gonna be, you can use these as a treatment for ADHD or ADD, but you should also be getting um, you know, you should be seeing a therapist because there's behavioral modifications that you have to make. It's not just medication. Um, the medication will help, but you also, you also have to have a plan to put other things into place. Um, so it shouldn't just be used by itself. These drugs are rapidly absorbed from the GI tract. They reach their peak levels in two to four hours. They are metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine. Half-lives vary anywhere from two to 15 hours, depending on what medication they're taking. Um, safety for using during pregnancy and lactation has not been established. Um, it's recommended that these medications are only used if um, the benefit to the mother clearly outweigh the potential risk to the fetus or the newborn. They are contraindicated with a previously known allergy. Um, they are contraindicated in the following conditions. So patients that have a lot of anxiety, if they're agitated, um, if they, are, they have a lot of high tension, severe fatigue, glaucoma, um, these medications can exacerbate these issues. Um, also patients that have cardiac disease um, or any kind of heart problems. Caution should be used in patients with a history of seizures because it could be um, which could be potentiated by the CNS stimulation. In patients with a history of drug dependence, including alcoholism, we should use these medications carefully because these drugs may result in a physical or psychological dependence. Adverse effect are gonna be nervousness, insomnia, dizziness, headache, blurred vision, anorexia, nausea, and weight loss. These medications interact with the MAOs, MAOIs, um, guanathinidine, the tricyclic antidepressants, and fioantine. All right, guys, we're almost done. Anti-seizure agents. So your patients that have ep epilepsy. Epilepsy is the most prevalent of all the neurological disorders. It's not a single disease, but it is considered a collection of many different syndromes characterized by the same feature, which is a sudden discharge of excessive electrical energy from our nerve cells located in the brain. When that sudden discharge happens, um, we have a seizure. That's what they believe. Um, the release stimulates motor nerves, which results in convulsions, um, sometimes tonic-clonic muscle contractions that have the potential to cause injury. They can cause tics or spasms. Um, it is believed that other discharges may stimulate autonomic or sensory nerves and cause different effects, such as um, some seizures are barely even noticeable or the patient might just have a temporary lapse in consciousness. They won't be as noticeable as the patient that goes to, has convulsions and those tonic-clonic muscle contractions. Um, epilepsy invo involves a loss of control. It can be very frightening to patients and um, very frightening to their loved ones and people that are around them when they have a seizure. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody have a seizure. I've never seen anyone have one in the hospital, but I saw one a couple years ago at a bowling alley and it, before I was a nurse and it was terrifying. Um, his eyes were rolling back in his head. He was throwing himself all over the floor. He was completely unconscious. He was foaming at the mouth. It's very scary. 
Um, so you're going to want to do a lot of educations with these family members and with the patients so that they know what to expect. And you want to educate the family members on how they can help protect them during these seizures because they're, you know, hopefully one of their family members is around when it happens because the patient can't do anything to help themselves. So there's a variety of different drugs that we use um, for treating seizures. Um, Dilantin is probably the most common. Um, Ethotoin is another one that I've heard of, but Dilantin is the one that I give all the time in the um, clinical setting. It is like the gold standard. Um, that medication is generally less sedating. Um, it may be the drug of choice for patients that are unable to tolerate sedation and drowsiness, which are some significant adverse effects with other medications. Um, these drugs do not cure the disorder. It helps the patients maintain function in a more acceptable manner so that they're able to carry out their activities of daily living. Um, drugs typically used to treat generalized seizures, stabilize, they work by stabilizing those nerve membranes and they block the channels in the cell membrane or those alterating, um, those alterating um, receptor sites. They work on the central nervous system. Um, so they, they cause sedation and other CNS effects are often the result. These drugs affect the brain and they reduce the chance of a sudden electrical outburst because that's what a seizure is. Those absent seizures, which are another type of a generalized seizure, may require drugs that are different than those um, to treat and prevent the generalized seizures. Um, and then we use these medications in both children and adults. So if you have a patient that comes into the hospital setting and they have a history of seizures, you are always gonna wanna implement something that we call seizure precautions. You don't need an order to do this. Um, and the doctor may overlook it in his order set and he might not order it. So this is where you are gonna wanna critically think and implement that procedures on their own. So what we normally do for seizure precautions is you always want to have a suction set up in the room. This is some, this is part of your safety equipment. You should always scan your room to make sure you have safety equipment in the room before your patient comes, but it doesn't always happen. Or you think that it's in there when you look and somebody needs something from another room and they run in that room and grab it. Um, I've been in many codes and rapids where we have not had suction in the room. When it happens once, you think it's just a freak thing that it's never gonna happen again. It's had, I've had it happen like five or six times as a nurse. Um, and it's really scary when you don't have suction in a room and you know patients are dying. Um, so you want to make sure you have suction. You also want to wrap their side rails. Um, some facilities come with um, actual padding that's actually made for the bed and it Velcros on. Where I work, we don't have that. What we do is we take big heavy blankets um, and we wrap them around the bed and we tape them. And then we take a pair of um, those fishnet underwear, like disposable underwear that we have that we give patients in the hospital and they stretch. So we just put them over top of the cover and over top that side rail. And that way, if they have a seizure, they, they're protected. Their head's not gonna hit the side rail and they're not gonna have any head injuries. Um, so that's what we consider seizure precautions. So this is just the site of actions for the drugs that we use to treat epilepsy and seizures. You can look at that. So we have barbiturates and barbiturate-like drugs that we use. So this is, would be your, um, let's see, these are gonna be phenobarbital, um, primadone, also mysoline, and then mephobarbital. Um, these are barbiturates. These drugs are associated with significant CNS depression. Um, the barbiturates and barbiturate type drugs inhibit impulse conduction um, in that reticular activating system. They and then decrease this, depress the cerebral cortex and they alter that cerebellar function and they depress the motor nerve output. Phenobarbital is available in oral and parental form. So if something is available in parental form, how are you going to give it? How are parental medications given? IV. I am. IV. IV. You got it. Oh. Yep. 
So if they are taken um, orally, they're going to be absorbed from the GI tract, metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine. Um, the drug is very low lipid soluble, so it gives it a very slow onset and a very long duration of activity. If it's given parentally IV, um, which you would probably give in an emergency in the hospital, um, the onset of action is going to be five minutes. So five minutes can seem like a really long time. This is an important slide. You guys might want to make note of this. When if there's family members in the room and a patient's having a seizure and this medication is ordered and you go to give it, they expect to see, um, you know, a change in their status almost immediately. So you're going to want to educate them and let them know that although this medication does work quicker, it does take about five minutes. That can seem like an eternity for a loved one waiting to, you know, when they're watching their loved one go through something like that. So that onset is about five minutes. You would want to, um, let's see, avoid these agents if they have any allergy. Um, some of these agents are associated with certain birth defects. So again, only use it if the risk outweighs the benefit, which it may, um, because seizures can kill you. Um, you wanna use these very cautiously with elderly and debilitated patients because they can respond adversely to that CNS depression. Watch those patients with renal or liver function. I feel like that's every medication that we talk about. Um, mod, um, adverse effect are the main ones that you see are related to that CNS depression. So um, confusion, drowsiness, lethargy, fatigue, um, constipation, dry mouth, weight loss, um, sometimes cardiac arrhythmias, changes in blood pressure, um, you might see urinary retention and then a loss of libido. They don't want to take with alcohol because it can um, increase the risks of the CNS depression. So you don't want your patients to take alcohol, be on, take, drink alcohol while they're taking this medication. Um, benzodiazepines, so this is going to be your clonopin or your Valium, also known as clonazepam and diazepam. Um, some of these medications are used as anti-epileptic agents. Um, so clobazine, clonopin, and diazepam, we can use for that um, reason. They are known to potenti potentiate the effects of GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that stabilizes those nerve cell membranes. They are absorbed from the GI tract, metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine, and they have an extremely long half-life, 18 to 50 hours. That's a very long time. Probably not a good choice of medication to use in the elderly adult um, because you know that they everything slows down and it's harder for them to metabolize things and excrete things. And if they already have kidney issues, that's gonna cause trouble for them. Avoid if you have any known allergies, is associated with certain birth defects, used cautiously in pregnancy, and then renal and liver impairment. We wanna watch those patients. Other drugs for treating absent seizures. Um, so we have three drugs that we can use. We can use Diamox, we can use Dalproic Acid, which is also known as Depakine or Zonagrin. Those are the three types of medicines that we use. Valproic acid reduces the abnormal electrical activity in the brain and increases GABA activity at those inhib um, inhibitory receptors. Um, diamox is a sulfonamide, which alters the electrolyte movement and helps to stabilize all the nerve cell membranes. Um, valproic acid can be given orally or parentally. It is absorbed in the GI tract. Um, it reaches peak levels in one to four hours. It's metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. It has a long half-life, six to 16 hours. Um, you don't wanna use, you wouldn't wanna use um, the Diamox if you had a um, adverse reaction to any sulfonamides. Um, or any thiazide diuretics because you could have a, a hypersensitivity reaction. 
um, valproic acid is also associated with liver toxicity. Um, it increases those CNS um, effects. You could see weakness, fatigue, drowsiness, dizziness, paresthesias. Um, the zomicide and the diamox can also cause a rash and dermatolo um, dermatological changes. Um, that. All this information is in your book, by the way. If you guys want to, um, you can read more about it. So partial seizures are different than the absent seizures. They involve only a single muscle or a reaction, or they can be complex involving a series of reactions or different emotional changes. The medications that we use to treat um, these partial seizures are Tegretol, Keppra, Kepra is also known as levetiracetam. You might hear that used. Um, gabapentin or Neurontin, they're both the same. And then pregabalin and Lyrica um, are also the same. And then we have Lamactyl or Lamotrigine. So these drugs are used to control partial seizures. They do that by stabilizing the nerve membranes in one of two ways. They either directly stabilize it by altering that sodium and the calcium channels or by indirectly by increasing the activity of GABA. We know GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and it decreases the excessive activity. Um, gabapentin is well absorbed in the GI tract. It's excreted in the urine. Pregabulin is reabsorbed, is rapidly absorbed orally, reaching peak hours in one to one to one and a half hours. It is not metabolized, but it is eliminated unchanged in the urine. Levetiracetam, rapidly absorbed from the GI tract. It goes through very little metabolism. Most of the drug is excreted unchanged in the urine. Um, Levetiracetam is very dangerous for the fetus and should not be used in pregnancy. <clears throat> Contradi that contradiction to these drugs, um, would be any presence or a known allergy to any one of these drugs. Um, patients that have bone marrow suppression because it can lead to exacerbated drug effects and patients with severe hepatic dysfunction. Um, they can experience drowsiness, weakness, confusion, headache, insomnia, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, upper respiratory infections, um, they can be toxic to the liver and the bone marrow. They, you do not want your patients to drink alcohol while they're taking this medication. And then something, this is important for you guys to know, um, Lamactyl or Lamotrigin has been associated with a very serious or life-threatening rash. So if you are just starting this, this, med your, this medication on your patient and they call out and they say, I'm itchy, I'm starting to have a rash, you go in, you would want to discontinue that medication right away. Do not give the next dose, call the doctor. Um, make sure you write a good note in the um, chart. They're probably gonna give you some Benadryl because you wanna make sure that they don't have any um, you know, side effects with their um, breathing that their throat doesn't close up. Post, um, patients with renal dysfunction are more likely to experience toxic effects with the levetiracetam, or which is also the Keppra. Um, so you would want to be careful and mindful that the, that the doctor is monitoring the dose that they get. All right, anti-Parkinsonism agents. So what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease is a progressive nervous system disease characterized by tremors, changes in posture and gait, and a mask-like facial expression. We do not know what causes Parkinson's. It's been, they've been experimenting with this, um, with this um, disease for years. They don't know the exact um, cause. It is known that the signs and symptoms of the disease are related to damaged neurons. Um, in the basal ganglia of the brain. There are multiple theories about the cause of the degeneration of these neurons. Um, and they range from some believe it's caused by a viral infection. Some believe it's caused by a, some type of significant blow to the head, um, possible brain infections, atherosclerosis, um, 
exposure to certain drugs, and then they also believe certain environmental factors can cause this, but they're not really sure. So it is the loss of dopamine secreting cells, which result in a loss of inhibitory dopamine effect. That's what they believe is to be responsible for Parkinson's disease. Um, it can develop in people of any age. Usually you see it in um, past middle age, entering their 60s. That's the common time, but there have been multiple people um, that get it earlier than that. Michael Fox, um, I'm sure you guys know him. He's an actor. He actually got it in his, I think it was his late 30s. So it's definitely possible in a younger age. There is no cure for Parkinson's disease. So any therapy that we um, provide is aimed at just managing the signs and symptoms to provide an optimal quality of life um, for as long as possible no cure. So this is um, where they believe the, generation, the degeneration of the neurons take place, which leads to that Parkinson's disease. So we're going to give them anticholinergics. These are going to help with those symptoms. So you might see um, cogentin is one of the medications. Um, Artain is one. Chemadrin is one. These medications work. They block the action of acetylcholine in the CNS, and they help normalize the acetylcholine dopamine imbalance. Um, it is indicated, obviously, for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, and it helps to give relief of those extrapyramidal um, symptoms. It's absorbed in the GI tract. Peak um, time that you'll see the drug is one to four hours, metabolized in the liver, excreted by cellular pathways, it does cross the placenta and enters the breast milk. Contradictions, any known allergies, if they have narrow angle glaucoma, any GI or GU obstruction or prosthetic hyper, um, hypertrophy. Um, you wanna use cautiously in patients who have a history of dysrhythmias, hypertension, hypotension, any kind of hepatic disease or if they're pregnancy, if they're pregnant and lactating. Adverse reactions. It can cause disorientation, confusion, agitation, delirium, nausea, vomiting, paralytic ileus, um, drug to drug interactions. You would not give um, in the presence of a patient that's taking tricyclic antidepressants or phenothiazines. One of the most common medicines that I see given is levodopa. I give this all the time. Um, the one thing that you want to think about these medications is that these medications have to be given at a certain time. So usually when you give these medications, you give them throughout the day. You give them in the morning, you give them in the afternoon, you give them right before dinner, and then they get a dose, a dose before bedtime. And it's imperative if you have five patients and you're looking at medications, if your other patients are stable, this is going to be the patient you're going to want to see first because these patients, you have to control their side effects so that they can go about out with their activities of daily living. So being able to bathe themselves, get dressed, you know, get a shower while they're in the hospital, feed themselves. You're wanna, gonna, gonna wanna control those tremors, things like that. Um, these um, agents increase the effects of dopamine at the receptor sites, and they have been proven to be even more effective than anticholinergics in the treatment of Parkinsonism. So this is the gold standard medication that you will see given. Um, it is the mainstay treatment, um, the precursor of dopamine that crosses the blood brain barrier um, where it is converted to dopamine. It's almost always given in combination with carbidopa, which is a fixed combination drug also known as Cinemet. The carbidopa, decreases the amount of levodopa that is needed to reach the therapeutic level in the brain. So it helps that medication be more therapeutic. Um, the dosage of levodopa can then be decreased, which reduces the adverse side effects. So there's a lot of adverse side effects with levodopa, but they combine it with the carbidopa because it'll decrease the amount that the body needs to get a therapeutic effect. So then in turn, they have reduced side effects. So when you see this medication in the clinical setting, it's gonna be carbidopa by, and then after that, it's gonna be 
the amount that's ordered. And then it's going to have a slash and say levodopa with that amount. I think it's like carbidopa three and then levodopa 125 milligrams, something like that. Um, but that's why that medication comes together. Um, more the dopaminergic drugs. You also have Symmetral, which is a popular one. Um, I've given Roniprenol, which is also Requip, and Mirapex. I've seen them given. These are all in your book. Um, they increase the levels of dopamine in the substantia nigra in the brain. They directly stimulate dopamine receptors in that area, and they help to restore the balance between the inhibitory and stimulating neurons. Um, they relieve the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease. They're well absorbed in the GI tract, widely distributed in the body, metabolized in the liver and the peripheral cells, excreted in the urine, and they cross the placenta. Contraindications to this medication, any known allergy, um, angle closure, glaucoma, any GI obstruction. Use cautiously in patients that have a history of cardiovascular disease, um, bronchial asthma, a history of peptic ulcer, urinary tract obstruction, and certain psychiatric disorders. Adverse reactions, anxiety, nervousness, headache, certain arrhythmias, blurred vision. Um, you wanna use these cautiously in patients that take these and, the, and those MAOIs and then also in patients that take vitamin B6. And then ultimately remember our goal of therapy is treating the disease, there is no cure. So you have your type one drugs and your type two drugs. Your type two drugs are your anticholinergic drugs that block the stimulant. And then your type one drugs, they increase the dopamine concentration. Um, some increase dopamine release, and then others stimulate dopamine receptors.